Who knows? You don't know. I might know, but I'm not going to tell you. Um, I just can't figure out what's wrong with my program. Yes. Um, so, all right, let's just jump into ODP 409. Um, So ODP 409 is just like ODP 408, but you're adding error checking, okay? And the error checking is the following. You want to make sure that there's exactly one argument on the command line. 408, you'd say ODP 408 space 25 prints the square root of 25. And I guarantee that I would only give you a valid number as an argument. So 409, you got to check the following conditions. Make sure there's exactly one argument. If you just say ODP 409, you don't have enough arguments, print out the word ERR and a new line and exit. If you say ODP 409 space 25 space 36, you got too many arguments, print out ERR and exit. If the argument is given but is not a valid double precision number, if you say ODP 409 ha ha, print out invalid and exit, INV. If you give it one argument exactly, it's a valid number but it's negative, print out negative, NEG and exit. Otherwise, exactly one argument, double precision number, not negative, calculate a square root, print out the square root, and exit. All right, so you've got three things you have to test, and if it passes all three of those, then you want to go ahead and print out the number. And I think the third test is either negatives or more than one argument. So, um, there's a file, s1pub, that you can use to see what your program should do. Okay, this is under slash temp. The write-up in Canvas mentions this. Um, slash temp slash s1pub, um, give it a number, it prints out the square root. And this program gives you lots of extra output to help you, but also so you can't just assess this program. Um, so stuff in parentheses is not stuff your program should print. It's explaining why it printed out what it printed out. Okay, so this is just doing what ODP 408 does, print out the square root. If you say 25, but you put on too many arguments, it prints out ERR, incorrect number of arguments. If you say program with no arguments, it prints out ERR, incorrect number of arguments. Yeah? So the question, is it going to be the same thing as before, where no matter what, the input is going to be a number, or will it be possible square root? Right, not a, not a number, print out INV, invalid. Is that what it means by the, if it's not a double precision number? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. A negative number, print out ENG, negative. Mm -hmm. Wait, what, what is that again? It's got to be a number, right? So what does it mean to say it's a double precision number? It means S scan F can convert it when you use percent LF. So do this. So what's the number we want to convert? It's the first argument, argv bracket one, percent LF, address of a double, so something like double X. And this thing returns an integer. Okay, the integer is not the value that you converted this to. The integer is a flag. Okay, if it's equal to one, that's success. Otherwise, there's some sort of error. So after you do this S scan F, don't just go ahead and take X and print out its square root, right? Check the return value, make sure it's equal to one. If it's not one, you didn't get a valid double precision number in RV bracket one. And so print out the error message. Now, how do you know if you have exactly one argument on the command line? Check the value of argc. So your main program 
is declared something like this. Right? Arg C tells you the number of arguments. And here's here's how arg C actually can be interpreted. If arg C equals one, there's no arguments. You basically just type in the name of a command and you hit enter with nothing after the command name. If arg C equals two, you have one argument, and you basically said command followed by an argument. If arg C is three, you have two arguments. And you basically said command followed by arg one, followed by arg two, and so on. So this number three is counting the command as, as something on the command line, but it's telling you you actually have two arguments after the command line. And how do you get to those arguments? That's from argv. So the first argument is argv bracket one, the second argument is argv bracket two, and the command itself is always argv bracket zero. So if you run this command with no arguments, arg c is one, arg v bracket zero will be the name of the command line. What will arg v bracket one be if you didn't put on a command argument? We don't know. Which means if arg c is equal to one and you try to do this, you're gonna seg fault. And that won't assess. So any time that you're using argv elements, any time you're looking at argv bracket one, make absolutely sure first that argc is at least two. If you want to use argv bracket two, make sure argc is at least three. Because if you try to do something with this and argc is only equal to one or two, you're probably going to get a seg fault. Okay, it's one of the most common problems that people run into when they're dealing with command line arguments. So the order in which you do things is critical. So let's do some pseudocode for ODP 409. And let me show you some pseudocode you don't want to do first. So we'll put this in red. Um, And we'll say no. Convert argv bracket one to double x. Y equals the square root of x. Um, if argc is not equal to two, print an error. If x is less than zero, print an error. Uh, otherwise, print y. Okay, so that's, that's probably not a bad sounding shot at some pseudocode, but this is not what you want, right? So what's wrong with what we've written up here, what I've written up here, I'll take responsibility for it. What's wrong with this? Um, so arg c, unless I got it wrong, if arg c is two, then we have exactly one argument. So that should be, that should be two, but, if argc is not two, this is gonna give me a seg fault. So this really needs to go before you do anything with argv1. Exactly. And if x is less than zero, do I wanna take its square root here? Probably not. It won't actually blow up on you, but it'll give you something different from what you might think. So before you take a square root, check to see if x is negative. And if it is, you don't need the square root, don't take it. Just go ahead and print your error message. So think about the order in which you're doing these things. Um, and this I would suggest, write a, write a short flowchart. Okay, it'll take you 60 seconds 
to put together a flow chart, right? I did pseudocode in 30 seconds to draw some boxes. Uh, about a minute to sort of figure out how you're going to do this. But make sure that the order in which you're doing things makes sense. Okay, make sure that you're not taking the square root of a number and then checking to see if it was negative, right? If it's negative, don't do the square root. Put a message and, and get out of there. If there's no argv bracket one, don't try to do something with argv bracket one. Because by the time I would get down here, it's too late. I've already seg faulted up here and my program exited. Okay, so just be cognizant of, of the order in which you're, you're suggesting that the program do things. That's some righteous autofocus in there. All right, so other questions on 409? So let me show you 408. All right, so there's, there's um, a good program for 408. So the usual include, include math.h, right? Argument list um, so that I can get to argv. And for 408, I told you that I would always run your code with a command line argument. So you don't have to check argc, right, if you trust me. You can believe argv bracket one will always be something. And so you just go ahead and you s scan that, mm -hmm. right, and you gotta use s scan f, otherwise it reads from standard in. Percent LF says, see if this thing is a valid double precision number. And if it is, convert it and store the result in X. And then I set Y equal to the square root of X and then printed Y with a percent LF. Right, and that should assess on all the test cases for 408. So 409, same thing, but you throw in a bunch of error checking first. And you print out other things if certain things happen. Yeah? I have a question. In the main, uh, inputs, you just have uh, character and then two of those stars. Mm -hmm. Those are two of them, not one. Yes. Um, so car star star argv. All right, so when we say car star s, what are we telling the computer that s is supposed to be? String. It's a string, which is also a pointer, which is also, it's one more thing too. It's an array, right? So these are all the same things. An array of characters, a pointer to a character, or for character is a string, okay? If I say integer star x, x is an array of integers, it's also a pointer to an integer, okay? If I said blah star x, X would be an array of blahs, whatever blah is. Okay, so this, we can usually change spaces. Let's think of it like this. So this is my blah, and this is saying argv is an array of these things. Well, what is a car star? It's a string, right? So this is saying that argv is an array of strings. That's what the two stars tell you. It's also an array of an array of characters, but that's not much fun to think about. So it's an array of strings, which means that each element of argv, argv bracket zero, argv bracket one, is a string, which is why we can do things like put it inside scanf and do conversions. Other questions? All right, so quick comment about ODPs. Um, I ran the latest grades this morning to upload them, um, and at least half the class is not getting 100% on the ODPs, okay? Um, 
ODPs are different from other assignments. Okay. Grade-wise, yeah. That one? Yeah. yeah. That was what? That was a lot simpler than what I did. Okay. Did yours did yours assess? Yeah, it worked. Okay. There's there's a whole science slash art form to writing short code. There's competitions to write the shortest code possible, things like that, right? Those are fun exercises. Um, but but to me there's nothing wrong with long code, right? And if if it makes sense, then it's even better than than shorter code sometimes. So, um, so ODPs, right? Um, Percentage-wise, it's a small part of your grade. You've got twenty or thirty ODPs. Um, they're all weighted equally. So if you get you know sixty out of hundred on one ODP, um, it's not a big difference grade-wise, right? It's going to be minuscule in the end. But my intent is that everybody gets a hundred percent on every ODP. Okay, and if that's not the case, you need to take some action. Because the goal of the ODPs is to make sure that you understand some concept or set of concepts today before you start class tomorrow. Because what we do tomorrow is going to build on what that ODP was testing, which was from today. And if there's something that you're not quite clear on, I couldn't quite get the number of argument thing figured out, right? If you don't correct that then, well, we're just going to start using that the following day and the day after and the day after. And eventually, you're going to have to figure out how to do the, the number of argument thing, right? But if you can't do that, you can't work on the next ODP. And so there's another piece that you're not going to be able to figure out and so on. And it's just, it, you just fall further and further into the sinkhole. So the ODPs are really meant as, as a tool to help, help you assess, right, where you are. Am I understanding this stuff? And if I'm not, right, here's where I need to do some work today make sure that, that I've got this understanding and then I can write the ODP and assess it and make sure that I'm clear on these concepts. Um, so if you read the assignment and it's not clear what I'm asking for, ask, okay? Send me an email, post something in the discussion group or ideally in class say, I don't know what the heck that means. Can you explain that differently, right? And I'll be more than happy to do that, okay? If you understand what it's asking for, and you write your code, and it's just not giving you a 10 out of 10, right? ask. Do the thing that I've described before, where you go ahead and you show me the code, and then you show me the assess command, and show me the G command, and the output, and all of that. Drag your mouse over it to copy it, paste it plain text into an email, send it to me. OK, and we can start from there. Um, or come and find me, not right after class, but you know, office or in between stuff, um, or something, okay. And let's let's make sure that before that ODP is due, right? You've got a solid understanding of how to do it. Um, I'm less accessible after midnight, and if you're starting your ODP at seven in the morning, you're taking a chance, right? Unless you're really, really, really sure that you know how to do this, you can nail this in your sleep, but you just want to like do it in the morning. That's fine. Um, you know, 755 is the same grade as as 12 hours earlier. But leave yourself some time because um, it's it's really it's meant to be a self-assessment, right? I'm pretty sure I know how to use Scanf, so I'll write this later. And then you try to write it, and it blows up and gives you a seg fault. Okay, there's something that you need to to figure out in more detail, um, and that's that's what these are for. So they're not just busy work. They're not just a way to get more grades. They're really meant to sort of help keep you in step with the material. Does that make sense? All right, so with that preamble, questions about 409. If you're not sure how to go about doing this, checking these conditions, printing these errors, right? Good chance to ask questions here. Yeah? So, uh, special characters can be included in that check. Special characters can be included in that check. So I could. Um, I could give you an argument of, um, you know, comma dollar sign twenty five parentheses, and you should detect that that's not a valid double precision. But if you use sscanf, right, that will do all that heavy lifting for you. 
whatever arg v1 is, whatever that argument is, if it's not a number, this is going to return something other than 1, which you can look at and you can say, okay, there's a problem with that. It's not a number. You can print out invalid, right, which is a whole lot easier than bash where we got to play games to figure out what the thing looks like. So scanf is an amazing function. Um, it actually does so much more than what we usually do with it, but it's, it's a full-blown parser. And you can do all kinds of powerful things with it. You can also do great evil, so be careful. <coughs> Other questions? All right, so let's talk about Unix. Um, Unix and Linux. So Unix was a commercial operating system developed a long time ago. Bell Labs um, for internal use originally, and it became a popular system on um, early computers by Digital Equipment Corporation, a line of processors called PDP processors, PDP 11 and 8. Um, and you can read all about the history of Unix online, so I'm not going to go through that. Um, but Linux was, was basically a pet project someone started, Linus. Um, started as a way to take some aspects of Linux and sort of redevelop it in an open framework so that people could access this and use it for free. Um, and it grew into, you know, what we have today, which is full-fledged um, Linux. I don't think Unix really exists anymore because why would it? Um, but Linux is everywhere, okay? Um, Android is Linux, OS X is Linux. Um, it's ubiquitous, right? Um, laptop computers, desktop computers, less than like, you know, 0.1% of the CPUs in the world today. 99.99 something percent of all CPUs are embedded devices cell phones, tablets, smartwatches, things like that, right? We don't see them because they're embedded, right? They don't sit on a desk and hum and take up space, but you know, there's a processor inside this camera that's doing something. There's a processor inside my mouse that's doing stuff. These things are everywhere, right? And that's the dominant uh, population, and it's not running Windows. Right? Some of these have no operating system, but if they have an OS, there's a good chance it's Linux or Linux-based. So it's, it's very much ubiquitous. Um, and it's not just kind of blind luck that this happened to be the operating system that caught on and found so many applications. To me, Linux was really developed with, with some philosophy behind it that made it very useful and has, has allowed it to survive all this time. Um, a big part of Unix is the idea that um, there's a kernel of functions of core behaviors inside the operating system. Um, but most things, the fact that we can type ls to list files, the fact that we can type gcc to compile C programs, those are not in some sense inherently part of Linux or Unix. Okay, they're not part of the operating system. The fact that I can say cat file name and see the contents of the file, that's not part of Unix, okay? Those things are all outside. Unix itself is pretty tiny, which is why you can port it onto, you know, uh, a smart pen or whatever your favorite tiny device is, a Raspberry Pi, right? Those little dongles, full-blown Linux setup. Um, Linux itself is pretty small, okay? So when I'm sitting, at a bash prompt, let me get out of the server. When I'm sitting at a bash prompt and I type the ls command and I hit enter and I see the stuff that's in my directory, ls is not something that is inherent to a Unix system, to the kernel. And it's not even something that's inherent to bash, right? Bash is this program that's running that waits for me to type something, hits enter, executes commands. Bash doesn't know anything about LS. Bash knows very little about anything. It understands a few things, like if I say variable equals hello, 
the program name bash, right, bash.c that was compiled and made this executable bash, understands, okay, there's something with an equal sign that's an assignment. The thing on the left is a variable name, var. The thing on the right is a string, h-e-l-l-o. Next time the person says dollar sign var, I'm going to give them back hello. Okay, that's something bash is doing. That's something that the program bash.c, right, has code in it that does that. But when I say GCC, and it says no input files, fatal error, that's not bash. Bash has no idea what just happened. So most of the commands that we type in Unix, most of the things we do in Unix are actually executing other programs. So when I say ls, there's a program somewhere named ls that's executing. So if I say what is ls, it tells me ls parentheses 1 list directory contents. Okay, this is an entry from what are called the manual pages. There's a set of manual pages. Picture a physical manual, right? Paper in a three ring binder. There's a electronic version of that inside pretty much every Unix system. And this parentheses one says ls is in chapter one. There's eight chapters. So ls is a command in chapter one of the manual pages and its purpose is to list directory contents. And if I want to actually see the entry in chapter one, I can say man ls, and there's the actual manual page. So this is from chapter one, user commands. The name is ls, list directory contents. That's what the what is command just told me. There's a description of it. There's a synopsis of, of the arguments you put on it. And then there's all these details, all these different switches you can use. For example, dash a says, do not ignore entries starting with dot. So normally, if you say ls, it shows you the files that you mostly care about. But there's other files in here. For example, I could say, let's make a file called dot ha ha. And if I say ls, I don't see that. But if I say ls-a, there's my dot ha ha down in that second row, along with two other weird files, dot and dot dot. So this dash a switch says, do not ignore entry starting with dot. Is there anything weird about a file named dot ha ha? No. It's just like any other file. It makes no difference to the system that this thing is called dot ha ha as opposed to main2. But by convention, the ls program, which everybody uses to list their files, by default will not show me dot ha ha. So it's called a hidden file. And it's convenient because for example, when we make a Git repository, we need a directory that contains a bunch of information, but we don't want the user to interact with that. So we make that directory hidden. We call it .git. But it's just a convention. And a lot of Unix is based on conventions, right? And other operating systems might have something hard-coded somewhere inside that says if a file begins with a dot, then it's a hidden file and we won't list it, right? And then 20 years later, that convention kind of sucks, but guess what? We're stuck with it because we got 20 years of operating system development built on top of it, right? Not the case here. So I think that's one reason for, for longevity, is longevity is that a lot of this stuff is done by the programs and it's just kind of agreed upon. All right, so there's lots of switches um, that you can have. Um, so dash D says show me directories, but don't list their contents. Um, dash n will show me something called, um, sorry, dash i will show me something called inode numbers, and so on and so forth. And so when I say ls, I could say ls dash l dash i, and say show me a long listing and show me inode numbers. Right, so I get these magic numbers in the front, which are internal numbers that are used by the operating system to keep track of where these files are located. And because we often want to put a lot of switches on things, we can abbreviate these and say ls-li, or we could say ls-il. And it'll understand that this is dash l followed by dash i, and it'll do both of those things.
but there's also there's also switches that we put on like dash dash author which will show us the author of each file so the problem is if we say ls dash author it might think this is ls dash a dash u dash t dash h dash o dash r so another convention if you have two dashes right dash dash author then it doesn't mean it's a bunch of individual switches this whole thing is a single switch so when you look at the man pages you'll see things like dash dash author dash dash escape dash dash block size right and so your switches your things that modify the behavior come in kind of two flavors a single dash followed by one letter or two dashes followed by something potentially longer and again it's just convention you don't need to memorize these the manual pages tell you exactly how to do this but sometimes it's easier to remember group directories first as opposed to some arbitrary one letter switch all right so we can say what is and it what is and it tells us what this thing is um, what is GCC and it's in manual page section one and it's the GNU project C and C++ compiler okay we can also say where is and it will show us a number of direc directories that contain files related to this command. So GCC, there's a file in user bin called GCC. There's a file in user lib. There's a file in user share man man one. So we got what is and we got where is. And we've also got which. So which GCC says, if I say GCC, what program are you going to execute? User bin GCC. And there may be executable versions of files named GCC in multiple locations. Okay, but which is telling me exactly which one is going to be executed. So if I say which ls slash bin slash ls, that's the file that's going to be run. So there's a hierarchy of files. There's a top level directory called slash, which we call root. And that has subdirectories under it, etc, usr, home, and so on. And each of these has subdirectories underneath it. And each of these might have subdirectories under it, and so on. And there's a whole hierarchy, right? So moving around that hierarchy, PWD says print working directory. Working directory and current directory are the same thing. So print the working directory. Where am I right now? I'm in this directory called slash home slash nick slash 224. So slash is the root. Home sits underneath that. Nick sits underneath that. 224 underneath that. CD says change directory. So let's just go up to the top level directory. Let's CD to slash. And if I print working directory, it confirms I'm sitting under the top level, the root. And if I do ls, there's everything sitting under slash. So there's etc at the bottom left, there's home in the second column, there's usr over here on the right, and so on and so forth. And I can cd into home and do an ls, and here's everything that's under my home directory. Now if I did this on the server, we'd see all the usernames of different people. And if I go down under Nick and I do an ls, there's a whole bunch of, of directories under there. I can go under Eclipse Workspace, and there's files under there. I can go into Test1, and there's files under there. And so now I'm like several levels down from the root directory, right? So it's just file hierarchy. So let's go into bin. And let's see what's in here. And basically, there's all the commands that are sitting inside bin. So here's ls. That's the program that gets executed when you say ls. And I can
can do an ls-l on it and it tells me ls is a file created last October it's 129,696 bytes it's owned by root and these first few columns are what we call the permission flags and we've, we've touched on these before these basically say what can different entities do to this file so those flags look like this They're in groups of three. This first set of three letters corresponds to what the owner of the file can do. The next three correspond to the group. And the last three correspond to the world or others. And R says you can read the contents of the file so you can look inside it. W says you can write the file so you can modify its contents. And X says you can execute. So if we look at ls under slash bin, it's owned by root, and root can read the file, write the file, and execute the file. Group is like, for example, every student on the Linux server is part of a group called students. So you have your own user ID, that's who the owner is, but then you're part of a group called students. And you could say, for example, okay, I'm allowed to read, write, execute, other people in the group are allowed to read and execute, and anybody else is allowed no access to this file. So it's just three sort of levels of, of permission. So the ls command, you can read and execute if you're in the same group as root, and anybody else can read and execute but not write. So every file has a set of permissions, and you can see those in an ls-l. All right, if you say CD without any arguments, that takes you back to your home directory, the place you log into. So if I do PWD after CD, I'm back in my home directory. You can also do CD tilde, and that takes you to your home directory. You can also do CD tilde and a username, and that takes you to that user's home directory. And there's, there's tons of shortcuts like that. So let me go back into my 224 subdirectory. And let's do the following. Let's make a copy of this file slash bin slash ls into my current directory and call it ha ha. Ha ha ha. So I'm in my own directory 224. I do an ls l. Here's the file I just copied. Ha ha ha. Still 129,696 bytes, but it's owned by Nick now. It's my file. I've got read, write, execute permission on it. And it was created at 1140 a minute ago. So can I execute this file? What's it going to do if I try to execute it? It does the same thing as ls, because it's just a file. No magic. OK, this is important. <laughs> There's no magic here. This is just an executable file. I could download the source code for ls.c. I could compile it with GCC. And I'd have my own compiled version of ls. And it would look very much like ha ha ha. All right, but I could make changes to that source code, recompile it, and make a new version of ls. Now, if you say ls, which ls is going to execute slash bin slash ls? I can call my ha 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 ls, but your ls is not going to point to my ls. You're still going to execute slash bin slash ls. So I can make changes to this, but it's not going to affect anybody else. right? But I can move ha 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 to ls. And now if I say which ls, it's executing the ls from dot. Dot is my current directory. So it's executing my copy of it. But if I say where is ls, it says, well, you got a few of them. You got one under slash bin. You got one under home nick 224 ls. But if you say which ls, you're not going to see that one under nick. So you kind of 
even though you're on a Linux server that's a shared resource, right, you kind of have a great deal of control over your own environment. I could make my own ls command if I wanted. And I could set it up so that when I say ls, it runs my command instead of the system one. And that's part of the idea of an open source environment. Yeah? How would you set it up so that you can create something but nobody else can copy it and then modify it? So if you, if you turn off the read permission, right, then nobody will be able to read it. And I don't know if you can execute if there's no read permission. That's a good question. I don't think you can. But if they copy it, wouldn't it be under theirs? But once they copy it, then it's their copy. They're the owner. And if you're the owner, you can always change these permissions. OK, so how do you prevent somebody else from potentially stealing your code then? Make sure that there's no read access. OK. Right? But if you give somebody read access, that means they can copy it. So what is LS? bunch of gibberish, but it's meaningful to the computer. So these carrots followed by an at sign, that's ASCII character zero. There's lots of zeros in files. Um, ELF is a flag saying this is an executable. Can't be as simple as executable Linux file, but I'll go with that for now. But it's an executable file. And then um, there's GNU, GNU, right? Um, GNU is not Unix. Um, and then we get into some good green stuff here. So this is executable code, presumably, that has meaning to the CPU. This is the ones and zeros after you compile and you assemble, and you've got your ones and zeros, and you download into the PIC processor, right? Well, this is the x86 version of that. It's the stuff that the CPU in my laptop understands. And we're looking at it as ASCII, but it's really just ones and zeros. And if you go further down, you start to get to some English. Why? Because you can say ls space dash dash help, and it will show you useful information about the ls command. Well, that's a bunch of printf statements inside ls.c. When you say printf, you have things inside quotes. That's what that stuff is. It's got to be in the executable somewhere. There it is. So there's some stuff in there. We can also do an octal dump with the od command. And this shows us the contents of the file in octal. So these are 8-bit bytes. Um, and there's different ways we can look at this. We can also use the command file. And file will tell us what a particular file is. So if I say file ls, it tells me ls is an elf file. That's an executable, 64-bit, x86, 64-bit version, and then a bunch of other information I don't really care about. If I say file main2.c, says that's a C source file. I don't know why it's doing that. That's a C source file. And it's ASCII text. If I say file tester, it tells me that's a directory. So you can use the file command to figure out what a file is, if you're not sure. All right, last thing I want to mention, there's always these two files, dot and dot, dot. Dot is an abbreviation for your current directory. And we use this sometimes when we want to run something like main2 from my current directory. We say dot slash main2. OK, I don't have to do that. I'll tell you why tomorrow. Um, but we can use that and say, go into my current directory, dot, execute main2. Dot, dot is an abbreviation for the directory above us. So right now, we're in home nick 224. If I say change directory to dot, dot, now I'm in home slash nick. If I change directory to dot dot again, now I'm in slash home. If I do this once more, I'm in slash. And from slash, if I try to go up one level, it just ignores me. It leaves me in slash, because that's the top. 
so it kind of wraps back on itself. So you can use dot and dot dot to move around different directories relative to where you are. All right, so that's, that's a smattering of commands. What I want to start with tomorrow is um, looking at this question of when I say ls, how does it know where to find that file? How does it know where to find GCC? Um, why don't I have to say dot slash main2? Why can I just say main2? We couldn't do that in 121. Um, so I want to look at execution paths, basically. Um, and then I want to talk about some other commands and start moving towards putting commands together. Okay, and this is the other thing about uh, Unix philosophy. Um, rather than create an operating system with a zillion commands that do every possible thing that you might want to do or someone might eventually want to do, a key part of Unix is that you take a few commands and you can put them together, right? So I've been doing Unix for about 38 years and I probably have like 20 or 30 commands I use. And there's, you know, thousands of commands inside Unix now. Um, and I probably use like 20 or 30. And use regularly, probably smaller than that. But you put them together, right, in different ways and you can do most things that you want to do. Once in a while I need a new command to figure out what it is, but um, you don't need to learn a thousand commands to be efficient in Unix. So we'll talk about how that works tomorrow also. All right, I'll see you then.